It's such a privilege to share God's word with you. I uh, was thinking as I was sitting here how as a kid I felt a call to preach. I'm the son of missionaries, but I was very shy growing up and uh, so shy that it was difficult for me to even give a book report in a high school class. When I was 15, I had a paper route and uh, our new church was under construction and I would get on my bicycle and uh, about 5.30 in the evening when my papers had all been thrown, uh, bicycle over to where the church was under construction. The walls were not yet closed in, the roof was not yet on, but the pilings were going up and the cement floor had been poured and the cement platform had been poured. And I would park my bike and I'd look around and I'd make sure that all the workers had gone home and then I would stand where I thought someday the pulpit would stand and uh, I would again look around to make sure no one was there. And then at the top of my voice, because Pentecostal preaching, if it's anointed, is high, loud, and fast. And the more anointed it is, the higher, the louder, and the faster it goes. So I would imitate Billy Graham. It's the hour of decision, you know? And I would, I would preach the entire Bible in about five minutes and then get back on my bike and retire into my quiet life wondering why in the world the Lord would call me to preach the gospel when I'm scared spitless to get up in front of a group. That has never completely gone away, and I'm glad. You know, sometimes we're stronger at the broken places in our lives. At the places where we don't feel adequate, He is adequate. My scripture today is a familiar one from John's Gospel, chapter 6. And um, it's a... It's a tremendous story of what the Lord does. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd, notice that word great, great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up into the mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near, which really means it's springtime and it's one year before the Passover in which Jesus would uh, die for our sins. When Jesus looked up and saw, there it, is, there it is again, a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where should we buy loaves for these people to eat, or buy bread? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Isn't it good to know that Jesus already has in mind what he's going to do in your life and in your ministry? Philip answered him. I wish I could have written this uh, sentence myself. I would have said, Philip answered him sarcastically. Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, uh, hopeful Andrew, uh, hopeful's not in the text, but that certainly describes him. Simon Peter's brother spoke up. Here is a boy with five, and now notice the word, small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place. And the, people, the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to them who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. And when they'd all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. If you go through the Gospels and eliminate the duplications of the miracles, you will discover that there are 35 specific miracles related by the Gospel writers. Most of them relate to healing. Next most common category is demonic possession. Then you have nature miracles, which this is one of them. And then you have the miracles of resurrection. There are three of those. Of those 35 miracles, there's only one miracle that is reported out by all four gospel writers, and that's the miracle we have just read. So I asked myself the question, why is this miracle so important that of all the miracles that Jesus did, this is the only miracle reported by all four gospel writers? And I believe the reason is that the miracle is far more than an account of a feeding of physical bread and fish on a spring day, it describes how Jesus intends to spiritually 
feed the world. It is a miracle that is a teaching miracle. So here's my outline for today. I have a kind of an unusual title, and you'll have to forgive me for this, but, it, but it's simply this, how to be a failure. How to be a failure. When we look at the year 2033, which Empower 21 is about, in terms of saying to ourselves, in 15 more years, we pray that through the Spirit-filled community, every person on planet Earth will have an authentic opportunity, an authentic encounter with Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. How can that be done? I'll tell you how it won't be done if we look at how things fail in the kingdom of God. The first principle is this. If you want to be a failure, look at the size of the task. Look at the size of the task. There is a reason why the word great occurs twice in this passage. Because the disciples are looking out over a sea of 5,000 men plus women and children who are hungry. The task is always great, and put the second principle to that, look at the little bit you have. Five small loaves and two small fishes. The challenge that we have before us is that the task that lies ahead of us will always be greater than our natural resources. And this work of the kingdom will not get done unless we understand it is not by might nor by power, but by his spirit, saith the Lord. Look at the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, there were 120 spirit-filled believers in a world of about 250 million people, it is estimated, in the Greco-Roman world. That's one spirit-filled believer for every 2,083,333 people. And they are told to go into that world, and they're to do it without the benefit of an airplane, an automobile, a train, a bicycle, a printed Bible, internet, iPhones, microphones. They had none of the tools that we have today, and there's one for every 2,083,333 people. It's an impossible task. The task is too great, the resources are too small. That would be equivalent in South Africa, there are about 55 million inhabitants of South Africa. Uh, if you take 120 spirit-filled people and put them in a population of, of 55 million, that's one spirit-filled believer for every 485,000 people. It's an amazing task. And although, as we have said yesterday, on Africa has the largest Christian population of any continent on earth, yet there are multiplied millions. There are over 2,000 languages in the world that, that yet do not have the Bible in their own tongue. It's an immense task that lies before us. And you face that on a personal level as you struggle with the immensity of the challenges that you face before you. If God has not called you to an impossible task, you're probably not walking in the Spirit because the Spirit is always calling us to do things that are absolutely impossible given the resources that we have. My uncle and aunt were pioneer missionaries in West Africa 80 years ago. I remember a story that my uncle told me he, uh, there was a, they had had a baptismal service of, uh, among the Mosi, and uh, one young man had been baptized, had given his life to the Lord, and, and, and as yet the Bible had not been translated into the Mosi language, so what they would do is they would have the new converts come to a class, and they would give them a, a sheet that had a Bible verse on it. It was called the Bitte Sheet from Acts chapter 15, verse 16, that was the first verse that was used. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So this young man came to the class. And, um, and then the next Sunday, they looked and he wasn't there. 
in the church. And the next Sunday, he wasn't there. And months went by, and he wasn't there. And finally, after months, he had come back, and the elders said to him, where have you been? And he said, I, I went back to my village uh, to tell people about Jesus. They said, but you don't, you don't have a, a Bible. You, you don't have a missionary. You don't have a pastor. How, how did you survive out there? He said, well, I, I had the Bible. I had this. And he pulled out the, the pamphlet, the bitte sheet. He said, I have the Bible. He said, when I would get discouraged and depressed, I would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I would be saved. When somebody in our family would get sick, I would pull out the scripture and I would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and they would be healed. And when there was oppression or discouragement, I would pull out this Bible verse and I would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I kept getting saved and saved and saved over again. That's the kind of faith that has sparked this immense movement toward Jesus in the continent of Africa and all around the world. You know, what the enemy will always do, the enemy will always, in your life and in your ministry, maximize the difficulty and minimize your resources. He will maximize the difficulty and minimize your resources so you won't even want to try. It happens when you give your life to Jesus. The enemy is whispering in your ear, hey, whatever made you think you could live the Christian life? He'll say it can't be done. And he'll do that in your life and ministry. What, whatever made you believe in this dream that you have of seeing the work of God established in the community and in the churches which you lead and which you are a part of? What made you ever think that God could break through in power in that circumstance? And we get our eyes on things. We get our eyes on the difficulty. We get our eyes on our few resources. If you want to be a failure, you do the third thing. You leave the Lord out of the picture. You forget that through the power of the Spirit, He enables you to take the little resources to meet the need of the many. My parents were pioneer missionaries to Northwest China and Tibet. My mother, in fact, went as a single missionary to Northwest China and Tibet in 1926 when she was, uh, or 1924 when she was 26 years of age. Um, you know, we've always believed that God is an equal opportunity employer, so he uses women as well as men. Hallelujah. And um, my mom served about seven and a half years up in that remote region of the world, came home, uh, spent about a year uh, raising support to go back, met my dad about a month before they got on the boat to go back. Uh, they, something must have happened on the boat because when they got to Shanghai, they got married. Dad was uh, 24 and mom was 34. Now get that age difference for just a minute. But you tend to marry who's near you, you know, so that explains why some of you are sitting with who you're sitting with. And they served faithfully until 1949. I'm the last child born of three. My mom was 43 and a half when I was born. We left because of the communist uh, takeover in 1949, which essentially made it impossible for missionaries at that time to stay. And um, the last Sunday I was in Xining, the capital city of Qinghai province. 41-year-old Chinese pastor preached that Sunday. He was the same age as my dad at the time, Pastor Meng. And I did not see him again for 39 years. We left behind a community of Christians in that town of about with three churches of about 500 believers. And we never got word out. My parents never got back to see what had happened. And they never received a letter, no communication. And when I saw Pastor Mung again, he was 80 years of age. The church had been, at that time, opened for five years. Property had been returned. But I said to Pastor Mung, tell me what happened. After my parents left, what happened? He said, well, two years after your parents left, uh, um, all the three congregations came together. Then a few years after that, I was arrested. I spent nine years in prison. I was released from prison, and I spent the next 16 years on probation. The church property had been given to others. I was not allowed. We were not allowed to have services. I'd meet privately with believers. 
He said, and finally, when I was 72 years of age, the local authorities called me in and said they had made mistakes during the Cultural Revolution. My case was one of them, and they wanted to apologize to me. He said, I looked across the room at those party officials, and I said, you took away the best 25 years of my life, and all you think you have to do is apologize? And they made the mistake of saying to him, what do you want us to do for you? He said, number one, I want the church to be returned, and we allowed to occupy our facilities again. Number two, I want to preach the gospel. Number three, I want my granddaughter to have permission to travel across provincial lines and stay with us and help us. We're now elderly. And number four, all these years you deprived me of income, you should pay me money or a pension. They were kind of taken aback at his boldness, but they conferred and gave him what he asked for. But in returning the property to him, they only gave him legal possession, not actual possession. And he went himself to get the people off the property that the government had given it to him, and they beat him up said, it took me three years to get them off the property. But he said, finally, when I was 75 years of age, I reopened the church. I said to him, Pastor Monk, how many people did you have that first Sunday? He said, we had 30. My heart dropped. All those years had gone by, and now the congregation of 500 had gone down to 30. I said, mostly old people. Because I figured, you know, with a 75-year-old pastor, probably mostly old people, old believers. Yes, he said. I said, any from my parents' ministry? He said, many. But I thought to myself, it's over. Said, well, what can a 75-year-old pastor do in an environment like this, where you cannot baptize anyone under the age of 18 because it's illegal? You cannot teach Sunday school or teach discipleship publicly to anyone under the age of 18 because that's illegal. Everyone over that is baptized, their name and address must be turned over to the local religious affairs bureau to be registered as a believer and therefore subject to persecution, harassment, and discrimination. What chance do you give that? So I said to him, well, Pastor Mung, now the church has been open five years. You're 80 years of age. How many believers do you have now? And I fully expected him to say 20. 10 have died. This is God's man of faith and power from America, you know. And um, he said to me, would you, uh, would you like to see our baptismal roster? And I thought, roster? They got a roster? His, he and his wife were living in a little room off the platform, and so that she went and got, it's a little bit bigger than my New Testament. It's cardboard front and back and crinkly white pages on the inside, held together by yarn. And I opened the first page, and it was full of, filled with writing. It was about a column that had name, address, gender, age, occupation. There were about 18 to 20 names. I thought, wow, they've really, done, they've really done well. I turned to the second page, and it was full of names. And the third page was full of names. And the fourth page was full of names. And page after page after page after page after page, I began saying to myself, I'm holding the Lamb's Book of Life of my old hometown. I finally handed it back to Pastor Mung and I said, Pastor Mung, how many believers do you have now? He said, we have 1,500 adult baptized believers. I said to him, how did this happen? He looked at me like I'd asked an American question. So we Americans are great on if I can just get the right book, go to the right conference, get the right idea, and I can replicate that. It looked at me like I'd asked one of those questions. He smiled real big and he said, well, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and we pray a lot. Amen. He was going strong until he was 96 when pneumonia finally got him, but when, when he laid down at the end, there were no longer 1,500 adult baptized believers, there were 15,000. In a church today that has a Bible school training young ministers and sending missionaries to Tibet, they never looked at the size of the task. They never focused on the little bit they had because we serve a sovereign and mighty God who is able to take the little we put in his hands. You know, I would love to have been there that day at the feeding of the 5,000. We know that at the end they picked up 12 baskets full. I'm assuming that they had 12 empty baskets at the beginning. 
And I can see the 12 standing around Jesus as he takes the five small loaves and puts about 40% of a loaf in each basket and then takes two small fish and puts one-sixth of a fish in each basket and then says to the 12, now start feeding the crowd. I'd love to have seen the expression on Thomas's faith. Lord, you got to be kidding. Our, there's more basket than there is food in our basket. Jesus says, go start. Thomas says, no, I got a better idea, Lord. Got a better idea. If you're going to do a miracle here, why don't you do it now and just take, just take these five small loaves and make a big pile of bread over here, about several feet high and just a, just a big pile, and make a big pile of fish over here. We'll, each of us will fill our baskets. We'll go serve the first row. We'll come back, re restock, fill the second row, restock, fill the third row, restock. And finally, when we got to the last person in the last row, no more fish, no more bread. Everybody will have enough. And Jesus, would, with a twinkle in his eye, would say, no, I don't do my miracles that way. I don't build my church that way. You want to start out with a lot and end up with nothing, I'm always going to start you out with a little so that you wind up full. And if you don't understand in your ministry and in your life that basic principle of the kingdom, you will fail. But God's kingdom grows when we do not focus on the size of the task, when we do not focus on the little bit what we have, but when we focus on the great Lord God Almighty, our Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power of the Spirit is able and will take the little we have and multiply it for His honor and for His glory. Can you say amen? Amen. amen.